and welcome to CBMC's English Worship Service. Thank you for tuning in. There's a story as Jesus was going off into Jerusalem, all the people were crying out, Hosanna. And the Pharisees said to Jesus, quiet your disciples down. And Jesus said that even if they were to remain silent, the rocks would still cry out. Meaning that somebody is going to worship the Lord, and if not people, then the rocks will. So let's make sure that the rocks are not crying out and worship on our behalf. Let's all praise the Lord.
You can turn to your bulletin at en.cbmcla.org slash bulletin. Today is the deadline for our virtual choir submissions. What we're asking everyone to do is to take a, a selfie video of themselves singing We Have One Faith. 
And so please turn that in today. Today is that deadline. And what they're going to do is compile all these videos together into one massive virtual choir video. And we'd love to see all your faces there. So please turn that in today. Also, today is going to be the first day that student ministry is moving from Wednesday service now to a Sunday morning service again, now that school has started back up. That is going to be on the student ministry YouTube channel, not this one. It starts at 11 a.m. and it will be this way throughout the school year. We also had our first outdoor worship service last night. It will be on Saturdays at 6.30 to 7 and we're just doing this as a trial. We will still maintain YouTube worship just like this, and this will continue without any change at all. So for those of you concerned about your health, we, we encourage you to stay at home. Those of you that want something more, a little different, and you want to join again, come Saturdays, 6.30, and it'll be meet at the parking lot, and you'll find a registration table there, and they will direct you to the back area where our services are going to be. And let's affirm what the word says. My heart is broken within me. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man, like a man overcome by wine because of the Lord and because of his holy words. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would fill us with your words, with your spirit, with your truth, that as we dive into your word, we would be in control of the spirit and we would walk by the spirit. So God, uh, we are your vessels and we pray that you would use us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we start off this morning, I want to introduce you to a Christian author named Heather Kopp. She's a believer, but she was also an alcoholic, and I want you to hear her story on her struggles with alcoholism. She said that alcoholism brought her to new lows. She fell down a lot. She embarrassed herself in restaurants quite a bit, and almost every single night she wouldn't remember the night before because she blacked out so often. She said that, and this boggles her mind now, she said that I continued to write and edit Christian books about parenting, about prayer, but at nighttime she would dive right back into the alcohol. On one hand, she knew she was a phony and a fraud and a liar, but on the other hand, she knew that she had a genuine experience in Jesus when she was a teenager. In no time at all, she had this cycle of over-drinking, of sincere repentance, of trying harder, but only drinking again and falling further and further into this shameful cycle. Angry and ashamed, she cried out in despair to Jesus, Jesus, why haven't you given me any victory in this? And she kept on praying for that. She didn't tell anybody about this. And she said, I was pretty sure I'd die of the shame if the secret ever got out. I thought the shame would be unbearable. Today, we're looking at shame and we're looking at hiding and what happens when you go in the wrong direction for a very, very long time. How do you prepare for that day when you want to change? Today, we're looking at the series of hardest days and, and what we're trying to do is we want to acknowledge that what we're going through now are very difficult days. If you lost your job, very difficult day. If you're trying to reinvent yourself and do something else, very difficult. If you've been trying to work from home while your kids are doing online education, very difficult. We get that. But we also want you to prepare yourselves now because there are going to be harder days that are coming down the pipeline. And we want, us to, be our, we want to be ready for that if those days, when those days come. Okay, so... Today, you are going to hear one of the most powerful truths, and I think one of my favorite stories, especially if you are not a believer in Jesus yet. This story is for you. Uh, maybe you've been on the fence waiting, and maybe there's a secret or a shame that you're hiding behind, and, and this message is for you. Because no matter what you've done in Christ, it says that God was reconciling you to him not counting your trespasses or your sins against you, but instead giving you the message of reconciliation. That's what God's great goal is. And, and maybe you're thinking to yourself, but you don't know the sins I've committed. And, and if anybody, and if God ever knew about the shame and the sins that I've committed, maybe he wouldn't accept me or love me. Well, today we're going to look at a guy that had to go through that. And his name is Zacchaeus. And the story goes, and you'll find it in Luke chapter 19, Jesus entered into Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and it was rich. 
Tax collecting was a very wealthy job, but it came at a cost, and that was the community. And you, we're going to see this in Zacchaeus. Let's go to the next verse, and I'll explain a little bit more. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. Circle that word, seeking. That's going to be very important later on. But on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. This word seeking meant that Zacchaeus was on a mission. Not, not that he just wanted to see Jesus, but he was on a quest, a journey to find out and discover more about this Jesus. Maybe he heard some miraculous stories that Jesus was doing. Maybe it was his wisdom and the teachings that he had. Whatever it was, there was something compelling about this prophet and this rabbi who claimed to be God. And Zacchaeus wanted to find out more, but he couldn't. And the reason why he couldn't, it says, well, it was possible, tradition has it, that Zacchaeus was a short man, and so maybe he couldn't see over the crowd. But the Greek word usually means something else, and it's the Greek word halakia, which usually doesn't mean anything to do with height. It says that it was small in stature or status. And the reason why was Zacchaeus was shunned from Jesus. So the crowd, if you can imagine, because they blocked Zacchaeus off because he was, didn't belong with them, what we see is Zacchaeus was, uh, was hindered from seeing who Jesus was. And in effect, the crowd was shaming Zacchaeus. Well, why were they doing that? Well, because Zacchaeus was a tax collector. And let me explain that for a second. Ancient Rome had a pretty genius idea about how to collect taxes. Rather than having the government do it like a centralized IRS, what they did was they leased out the job to private companies or to private individuals. So people, if they wanted the tax collecting job, would go to Rome and apply for it and they would make these bids. So if you bid $100 but I bid $1,000 for the job, I would get awarded with the position. Now, of course, in order for me to recoup that $1,000, I would go to my constituents and I would raise their taxes. And tax collectors had the power to throw people into jail. So of course they had power and you can see why the community hated them. What happens when you've been going in the wrong direction for a very long time? The first thing is you start hiding your shame. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him for he was about to pass that way. In order for you to understand this story, you need to understand first century social rules. And there are going to be two rules here that are quickly broken. The first one is you don't run. This was a shame-based culture and very similar to Asian cultures where shame was this invisible quality, this currency, that if you did something wrong, you would bring shame upon you and upon your family. You did not do anything to lose face or respect. So for a man to run, this would be shameful to his family. Why was that? It's because when you're running, you expose one's legs. And that was a huge no-no in ancient Near Eastern culture. Now, Zacchaeus had everything he wanted. Why would he bring shame upon himself first by running? But then he compounds a shameful act of running with something else, and that is he decided to climb a tree. Again, first century rules said you didn't climb a tree. And why was that? Well, take a look at the way ancient Near Eastern men would have dressed. Jewish men started off with a loincloth. That would have been their underwear. But then they would have had a tunic on. And the tunic, imagine, is a long t-shirt that went to maybe the thighs. And that was a little bit of an undergarment. Then they would wear a cloak over that. And this cloak would have been a robe. And it went all the way down to their feet so that they wouldn't show uh, their legs. Now, this is very similar to a woman wearing a dress or a skirt. And so just as you don't see women in dresses climbing up a tree, why? Because they would expose themselves. It's the same way that Middle Eastern Jewish men would have never done that. They would have never climbed a tree because anyone looking up would have been able to see too much. And so you see Zacchaeus, now he's going and exposing himself and showing even more shame to this. But the interesting thing is people like Zacchaeus and tax collectors, guess what? They stopped caring about shame a long time ago. But there's an important detail further that I want to explain. And that is Luke describes this tree not just as any other tree, but he describes it as a sycamore tree. The Greek word for that is sycamore. Most of us aren't tree people, but, but here what you're seeing is the sycamore tree in Jericho that they've identified as the one that Zacchaeus would have climbed up. Now, 
Let me change the story just a little bit more. A sycamore tree is also known as a sycamore fig tree. And where do you first hear about a fig tree in the Bible? You hear it in Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, after they ate the fruit, it said, then the eyes of both were opened and they fell and they knew that they were naked. And they sowed fig or suka leaves. They sewed them together and they made themselves loincloths or underwear. So don't miss this visual picture. Adam and Eve, after they fell from grace, after they ate of that fruit, they would have covered themselves in fig leaves. And they used this as underwear. In Zacchaeus' story, everyone is out watching Jesus as he's walking by, except for one guy, Zacchaeus. And because of his profession and his shame, he decided to also look like this. But Jesus sees you're hiding in your shame. And in verse 5, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up. And he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. Everyone else in the parade was visible. Everyone else was standing right there on the street. But Jesus saw the guy who was hiding in shame, covered in fig leaves. Some of you are watching today, and you know you've been hiding from God. You know that you're kind of interested in Jesus, but only somewhat at a distance. But the fascinating thing about this is that Jesus is really, really good at finding where's Waldo. And he knows where to look. And he knows everyone, and he sees where everyone is, and he spotted Zacchaeus. Now, what would Jesus say to the shameful tax collector now? Jesus wants to dwell with you, a shameful sinner. Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. And so he hurried and came down and received him joyfully, and when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Which rabbi, an honorable rabbi, would choose when he could have picked anyone's home to stay in, would have gone into the home of a tax collector, someone of low status, someone who was in shame. Now, staying at someone's house has rich theological meaning, especially in the Old Testament. You see, God has always wanted to dwell or to live with people. And it starts off when he does, he had a tent or known as the tabernacle. And whenever the Israelites moved and they had a camp, God's tent was in the middle of everyone else's tent. So physically, God was living with his people. And uh, he had this great goal of wanting to dwell there. Ironically, people always wanted to move out of God's house because they didn't want to abide by his rules. So God went into another phase and he decided to send his son Jesus. And it said that the word became flesh or became a living person. And it said that the word dwelt among us because God still had this great goal of wanting to live with his people. That never changed. Now fast forward until heaven and one day heaven is described as God's dwelling place with everyone and it says in Revelation 21 3, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people forever. And finally, everything is marching on towards the one day where God and humanity can dwell and live together in God's house all over again. And this truth is represented by Jesus showing up and seeing this person in shame and in fig leaves and saying, I must dwell in your house today. Well, of course, Zacchaeus' reaction was full of joy, so much joy, he sped down and he embraced the Lord. The shame was no longer unbearable because Jesus wanted to associate with somebody in their shame. The lost and the hiding could now be found. Back to Heather Kopp for a second, the one who struggled with alcoholism. She had a breakthrough moment, and one morning... She was praying and she was crying, uh, sobbing incoherently. She said, eventually I got off my knees and I had a strange calming presence come over me. She walked the dog, she drank her coffee, she knew something was different and she pr was pretty sure that she was miraculously delivered from her alcoholism. Oh, he's delivered me, magic. I mean, I'm not gonna drink again. Mm -hmm. And that afternoon I drank. Mm -hmm. And then I realized 
oh, the breakthrough was not a miraculous cold turkey deliverance. It was a willingness to tell my husband the truth and to get honest and ask for help and come into the light and experience the crushing of my pride. And of course, you know, all those years, I thought the shame would be so unbearable if I ever came out, that kept, that kept me hiding. And then, as I was saying to Randy earlier, when I did finally, Dave came home from work last night and I said, I know you already know I have a problem. It's way worse than you ever thought. I can never remember what we did the night before. I mean, I was having blackouts and it, I could hardly work toward the end, really. And, um, but the relief, the relief when I came into the light. Being open. Oh my gosh, getting honest and saying the truth and finally just putting it out there. Um, I had expected unbearable shame, I would die of it. And instead it was just, oh my gosh, the relief to be free, to not be hiding. Pastor Christopher last week talked about how important it was to make confession a habit. And that's because there is something healing about it when you bring something out into the open and the community is going to give you grace rather than judgment and shame. So when the community does that, that's when you find healing. You think the shame is unbearable, but God has different plans. And that plan is to bring that shame into the light and you will find, just like Heather Kopp did, relief. But you must repent and restore. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded, or the word succophant, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. Zacchaeus, you must notice the order here. Did Zacchaeus change course before he met Jesus? And the answer to that is no, because this is the important part. Behavior change does not happen to someone when they're in shame. It just doesn't. Shame is effective in keeping people in line before they go in the wrong direction. But once somebody has gone in the wrong direction, shame is highly ineffective at bringing them back. You got to understand this, and especially for those of you that rely on shame. Professor Brene Brown says shame needs three ingredients for it to thrive and to grow exponentially. Secrecy, silence, and judgment. Meaning that the more shame that you use on someone that's gone on the wrong direction, the more they're going to continue going in the wrong direction. And Zacchaeus had all three. All the judgment that was put upon him, what did he do? It brought him into more shame by running. And then what did he do? He, had, he compounded his shame upon shame by now climbing up a tree. Because he had so much shame upon him, he just didn't care anymore. Expecting Zacchaeus to change would be highly ineffective because of the state of shame. What it takes for people to reverse course is for God to come into the picture and for God to say, I see you. And for God to say, I, will, I must stay at your house. I want to connect with you. I want to have fellowship with you. Brene Brown again says, shame depends on me buying into the belief that I am alone. Shame cannot survive being spoken and shame cannot survive empathy. And Jesus does both. If you're still wondering about Jesus and placing your faith in Jesus, what you need to understand is you don't need to change your life before coming to God. It doesn't work that way. My parents tried to shame me into believing in God and they, they would say things like, first I need to get my life right and to be a good kid and then I can come to Jesus. Guess what? They didn't know their Bible. The, that was poor, terrible theology and the Bible teaches nothing like that. Why? Because because of our shame, we can't save ourselves. Uh, you see Zacchaeus, he knew the law. He knew how to restore. In fact, it says it right here. If a man steals an ox or a sheep and kills it or sells it, he shall repay five oxen for an ox, four sheep for a sheep. After he meets Jesus, now he understands the law and now he's willing to abide by it. But he knew it. Why didn't he do it before? Because he was in shame. And then the last point. Jesus came to seek and to save you. It says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Remember how I told you at the beginning to circle the word seek. And that's because Zacchaeus was trying to seek after Jesus only to hide. 
Instead, what is fascinating and ironic is that it was Jesus who was seeking out Zacchaeus the whole time. Tradition has it that he became a bishop, a pastor, if you will, of a church in Caesarea, which is one of the larger cities in all of the Roman Empire. How do you prepare for the day when you want to change direction because you've been going in the wrong direction for a very long time? Two truths. Number one, Jesus has been seeking you. Second truth is Jesus wants to dwell with you. Now, here's the important part. I don't think that the takeaway from this is really for the person in shame. Because as we've talked about it before, people in shame can't come out of shame on their own. It doesn't work that way. I think the takeaway for this is to people at CBMC, is to the church. So church, I'm directing you. If we want to be the kind of church that is going to seek and to save the lost like Jesus did, we must not resort to shame and judgment. Because all that's going to do is ostracize people even more and to cost them time in wanting to come to Jesus. Shame begets shame. And so the church, I hope I made it clear on this one. The thing that you must do, if we want to prepare people to have a right relationship with the Lord and change direction, we got to be the kind of culture, the kind of church, the kind of body of Christ that looks like Jesus that is going to do these two things. Number one, we have to have eyes to see those that are lost and hiding amongst fig leaves. But the second thing is, you need to stay at their house. And the simple word of that is we need to continue to extend fellowship with those people. And so continue eating with people. Continue inviting them over to your home or making yourself available at their home. Don't break the relationship. Don't ignore them. You should still, of course, continue to call them into repentance and into a relationship with the Lord. That doesn't change at all. But if we were a church that did those two things, that we sought out those that were in shame and we still were willing to embrace them and extend some amount of fellowship with them, it would be way easier for them to come back to Jesus. And that's what you see in this story with Zacchaeus. Let's pray. The Heavenly Father, I pray that if anyone here is struggling with their shame, that Jesus, you would meet them that they would know your eyes are on them and that you see them, but that they would not feel judgment and instead that they would hear the message from you that you want to dwell with them, that you want to live in communion with them. And God, for our church, we pray that we would be a church that seeks to save the lost too, just like you did, and that we would extend fellowship, that we would not consider ourselves more holy than anyone else, but that we would see everything as an act of grace. For by grace we have been saved through faith. And this is not a result of anything we've done. May you bless us. And now let's pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen.
goes to the straight Come sit at the table Come taste the grace There's rest for the weary Rest that endures Earth has no sorrow That heaven can cure So lay down your burdens Lay down your shame And all who are broken Lift up your face So lay down your heart, lay down your heart, come as you are, come as you are, fall in his arms, come as you are, there's joy for the morning. A sinner be still Earth has no sorrow That heaven can heal Earth has no sorrow That heaven can heal So lay down your burdens Lay down your shame And all who are broken Let's close with our benediction. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen. We thank you for joining us today, however you may be watching. And we hope you have a great rest of the weekend. We will see you soon.